thanks for being here. Uh, tuning in to this uh, presentation of program benchmarks and what to expect during the ARCA treatment from enrollment to discharge here at Kalo and Link Ozark. My name is Josh Nordine. I'm the Clinical uh, Services Director here at Kalo. Um, who I oversee is our clinical directors, our academic program, neurotherapy, and animal assisted therapy. So let's dive in. It's not possible to talk about uh, the process at Kalo without really identifying and, and delving into the, the foundation of everything that we do. And our CASA model, this developmental framework, is the foundation of everything that we do. It really informs uh, every intervention, every department. We train every staff from our maintenance man to our, our cooks in the kitchen. Every staff is steeped in our CASA model. Why? because it takes reps. It takes repetition of experiences over and over and over again. I'm an old football coach and I know that the only way to learn something so that you really know it in the heat of the moment is to have reps. And so for our students, we wanna create as many reps of experiencing this co-regulation in a committed, attuned, secure, accepting relationship. So as we look at this model, you know, we, we recognize that this is a cyclical experience. This is a cyclical journey for our caregivers. This is not a linear process. You don't start here and progress to be, and there's never a problem. There's never a setback. In fact, the deeper in you get in relationship with your kiddo, the scarier that is for them. And so a lot of times you're going to have to circle back around to acceptance back around to that foundational commitment that you've made to your kiddo to provide for them, provide for their needs. Um, this is a hard process. Loving these kids and, and caring for these kids is not easy. It's actually really hard um, to undo the, the hurt and the pain and the damage that's been done in that early developmental time in their life. So CASA, we'll talk about a lot um, but their goal is really attunement that informs this co-regulation because we know that when you're really connected to your kid, you're really in sync, they get what they need, and you're able to provide that for them, and it just creates this experience of joy. Even if you have to go through some hard stuff, it creates joy, and that's our goal. So what does co-regulation look like for, for our students? We know that they're co-regulating with a, a trusted relationship and they're receptive to empathy. When they can accept that side hug, that pat on the back, when they can experience some vulnerability and, and they can say, hey, this is how I'm really feeling. This is where I'm hurting. This is what I'm afraid of. When we can see that congruency between, we know that they're struggling and they talk, you know, they, they don't just say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, leave me alone. But really, we can tell, man, we, it's obvious you're going through something and they can say, yeah, I really am. And they let you in and you have that flow, that flow in the relationship where they know what's going on with you. They feel that you feel what's going on with them. There's that back and forth flow in the relationship. When we talk about attunement, <clears throat> it's really about determining where is your student, where's your kiddo on this relational continuum, every relationship, exists somewhere on this continuum from unhealthy attachment to healthy intimacy. And so in order for us to really provide that experience of co-regulation, we have to understand where, where is our kiddo on this continuum. Now, unfortunately, most of our families are really, really familiar with this unhealthy attachment. This is where your kid is at most of the time. And so you experience this lack of trust, some of these unsafe behaviors, right? Maybe they're looking to substance abuse, or they're looking to self-harm, or they're you know they're physically aggressive, or just really verbally aggressive, and and we we can tell based on those behaviors that their attachment to a to a caregiver is really weak, that it's really unhealthy, um, that they are experiencing some sort of fear response to safe relationship. It's really hard to distinguish, I think in our minds, uh, the difference between behavior 
and survival. You know, we, we look at these behaviors and say, man, if a kid is lying and they're stealing and substance abuse and, and they're self-sabotaging, they're unpredictable, they're just generally unsafe. What's our society say? They say, that's a bad kid, right? That's a bad apple. What we have known uh, and, and continue to see to be true is that these are survival responses. These are our kids' best attempt to try to feel safe and okay in this world because they don't feel safe in relationship. They don't have that safe home to return to, that safe casa um, to go home to. And so all of this mess, all of this noise is them trying to be okay. Now, if we move towards the healthy intimacy part of relationship, we see a lot more of these things. They're able to, to experience and, and provide care and empathy for others. So there's reciprocity in their relationship. There's repair, there's safe touch, um, there's connection. And depending on where your kiddo is on this continuum, you could see a mix. You could see that maybe they're becoming more vulnerable, but they're still not really predictable or, you know, so they're, it's not cut and dry. Um, so if we can use this continuum as a guide to know that, you know, if we're, if we're moving, our, we want to move towards this healthy intimacy, we have to, we have to look for evidence um, that they can, they can handle the privilege and the trust that comes with that healthy intimacy and that healthy connection. Um, so when we talk about these behaviors of stealing and lying and, you know, uns just substance abuse, whatever the, the, the lack of safety is, one of the things that we, it really helps to kind of conceptualize is that this is a dysregulation in their nervous system. This is their body feeling unsafe. It's not because they're bad apple. It's because this is a fight response or a flight response, uh, you know, a, a collapsing response, a freeze response, or maybe they're just really into that appeasement place. And that's one of the things that I think harder for for folks to recognize is that you can have a you can have a kiddo that is acting really good, right? They're well spoken and they're saying all the right things and and they're they're laying low and but it's very much possible for a kid to be in a really unhealthy attachment place um, and, and be appeasing uh, because they feel super unsafe. They don't feel safe enough to have conflict or to, to make a mistake. And so when they do make a mistake, it's devastating. It's devastating for an appeaser to mess up, right? Because that self-concept isn't strong enough to hold up to that failure. And so we see a lot of these kind of behaviors and, and maybe you're looking at this list and you're saying, man, that's my kid. That's my kid in a lot of ways. But we have to recognize that the behavior is a sign. It's a data about where they're at in their attachment. It's not a character flaw. It's not a moral deficit, but it's really data about how they're experiencing their world and how they're interpreting the things that are happening to them. So as we look at this continuum, and our goal is to really tune in, it's almost like a like a radio dial, like an old FM radio dial, if people still listen to those. You know, when you're you're not quite to the to to where you know what's going, you know, you're you're not quite tuned into the radio station you want, there's a lot of static, right? And it's the same way with our kids. That behavior is just that static. It's the noise that keeps you from being able to tune into what's really going on. And so we look at the data, we look at the behavior to help us determine where on this continuum are they. Now the constants, regardless of where they are, that we have to hold on to and we have to provide our unconditional love and bottom lines. If your kiddo can experience that regardless of they're having their worst day or their best day, that you love them, that you're committed to them, that you believe in them, and also that you're going to hold on to your boundaries and your bottom lines of what's okay and what's not okay, they're going to begin to, to experience safety in that relationship that can help them to, to begin to develop. 
uh, into their, their full potential. So what do we do as we try to figure out what a kiddo, where a kiddo's at in this process? We're going to, depending on where they're headed, either increase trust and privilege, be more flexible because we're seeing vulnerability and connection. We're seeing repair happen. That no, that tells us that they're in that healthy relationship place, or we're going to decrease trust and we're going to decrease pro- privilege and really focus in on establishing safety and reinforcing those bottom lines. It can be really difficult for families at Kalo when their student is is needing the extra support of a safety team home, or maybe they're needing safety closeness, um, that extra kind of level or layer of supervision over and over and over again. Uh, because it feels like, man, they're missing out on the adventure therapy, or they're missing out on, on canine training, or they're missing out on all the cool outings and things that the teams are doing. And I think it's important to recognize that if your student is over here, but we're trying to give them the trust and the privilege that's more associated with here, that's a misattunement. We're missing the mark. The goal is not to for a kid to experience all the trust and the privilege. The goal for us is for your kiddo to experience your attunement and your co-regulation. So if they need the, the, the focus on safety and bottom lines and the decrease in trust, and you provide that for them, that actually does a whole lot more good than if they, they need that safety, but we're giving them privilege. The reason for that is because of shame. Shame and guilt, they seem similar, actually quite different. Guilt is, I did something wrong, right? I broke a plate. Um, I didn't do my homework. I hit my brother, right? Shame tells, tells you, I, there's something wrong with me. I am bad. I did something bad versus I am bad. So I broke a plate because I'm destructive. I didn't do my homework because I'm lazy. I hit my brother because I'm violent, right? And so shame is this deep-seated, gnarly, gross, sticky, icky belief in one's own worthlessness, And it's rooted and steeped in this experience in early childhood, this developmental period from uh, in utero up until, you know, as late as seven years old, where something bad happened and it must be my fault. And so that impacts this self-image, right? Because kids in that, in that developmental period, everything is egocentric, right? I look at, I look at young kids in my life and I say, you know, they, they, they like are little kings where they think that they can just order everything around because they have this idea that they're omnipotent and that they, what they say should go and that they're in control of everything in the world. And so when they don't experience that control, it's really frustrating. So take your kid and whatever their experience was, whether it was an adoption or they were, they spent some time in an orphanage or Maybe there was a divorce or there was some sort of traumatic experience for that kid. They experienced that pain as being related to their own inadequacy, their own, um, their own weakness, their own, whatever, whatever pain they experienced is because of something wrong with them. And that develops this internal sense of shame. And so we see blaming versus a lack of, accountability, you know, versus accountability, because, man, if, if I did something wrong and I take accountability for it, people are going to know how bad I am. And so they're going to kick me out. You know, they're going to leave me. They're going to abandon me. They're going to hurt me. So I can't handle that. So I'm going to blame. I'm going to try to point to somebody else, right? I'm going to self-sabotage if I experience any level of success, because if I succeed, then that's what everybody's going to expect of me. And then I'm going to mess up and they're going to see that I'm a mess up. I'm a screw up. I can't do it. And I'm just a failure. So, and then they're going to leave me or they're going to hurt me or they're going to, you know, and so instead of 
experiencing success and then failing, I'm actually going to blow it up myself so that at least I'm in control of that. You know, I'm not going to let people empathize with me and connect with my emotions because if they really knew how I felt, they would leave. They'd run as far and fast as they could. Right? I'm going to avoid uh, challenging things. I'm going to shut down. I'm going to get defensive. Or I'm going to work really, really, really hard and make sure that I don't fail. We actually see a lot of really, really successful people that are compensating. Um, and so maybe your kid has those perfectionistic tendencies where they just get obsessed. They get obsessed and locked in with, I need to do this the right way and I can't fail and I can't make a mistake. One of the things with shame is that if you go back to the, the relational continuum, that misattunement or missing the mark of where they're at, that creates shame, that increases shame, right? Because if I can't make my needs known and I can't get my needs met, it's because there's something wrong with me. They don't have the ability to say, oh, maybe mom had a bad day. Maybe dad was dealing with his own stuff. It's all filtered through this self-concept. And so it, it makes it important for us to tune in and, and to really learn and do the work and make the effort to learn where our kids coming from and to understand what's the emotion that's going on underneath the surface for them. So again, our goal is co-regulation tuned in to where your kids coming from, setting good, clear, consistent boundaries with lots of acceptance and belief that they're doing the best they can. So let's dive into kind of the time periods and, what you may experience and what your kid may experience during their time at Kalo. <clears throat> so early on, in your first four months uh, in the program, your kiddo is going to be experiencing a lot of different things, new things, new people, new relationships, new rules, new schedule. And so we, we see a lot of times either they kind of honeymoon where they're just trying to lay low trying to fit in, trying to go with the flow. Maybe they, they think, oh, if I can if I can act good, mom and dad will bring me home. I don't like this place. This is scary and overwhelming. So I'm going to just lay low. I'm going to hold it together for a few weeks, a few months. And mom and dad will see that I'm doing good, I'm doing better, and then they'll bring me home. All right? Or maybe they hit the door and they go for the fire alarm or they... <laughs> They start swinging or whatever it is, and we have an immediate kind of behavioral response. A really interesting uh, day a couple of a couple of years ago where I had this a kid transition and going home and really celebrating his progress and, and a new kid coming in the door and the, the new kid hit the hit the door and then hit the door again and he was running out in the woods, right? So we can see any kind of uh, range of, of response to that initial shock of being in a completely new environment with new people. Your kid's going to test boundaries with staff. Um, they're going to do a lot of chameleon-like stuff. They're going to really seek the approval of their friends, of their peers. They're going to go for that low-lying fruit, that low-hanging fruit that I, if, I, if I joke about this with friends or if I self-harm like this or I play up my substance abuse like this, then people, you know, I'll, I'll get some of that, that easy acceptance from people. I know that I can't get the approval of my caregivers, of the adults, so I'm going to really focus in on, on my peers. Develop some of those real shallow relationships that we're all familiar with. And um, what they're needing is, is constant reinforcement of boundaries. And so, you know, you're going to see a lot of behavioral response in this initial period. Um, they can't accept a lot of accountability and... And they're either, you know, disengaged from their caregivers, you know, uh, refusing family sessions, refusing this or that, or they're, they're just really staying on that surface level uh, where they're just really lashing out. We see a lot of those kind of responses from kids. For our parents, um, you have exercised your commitment because you have gotten your kid to Kalo. And it's important that you know that we value that effort that it takes to secure finances, to, to, to work out logistics, to do all the things that you've had to do to get here. Um, it's a process. Um, 
and it's taken a lot of work. Um, and so we value that and, and, and honor that, that work and that commitment that you have shown. For a lot of parents, trusting the process uh, is, is tough because you haven't, you haven't been through it. You know, we, I think one of the things that we struggle with at Kayla is we kind of take for granted everything that we do every day. Uh, we, it's of, it's of course that we're doing this, you know, according to our policy, we have the best intentions here. Like we kind of take for granted uh, the fact that maybe our parents, this is the first time you've ever been in treatment, like a residential treatment uh, situation, or and maybe this is, you've been at seven different residential placements before this and this, you know, you're, you're scared that maybe this is just another one of those things. And so because there's not that trust, there's not a ton of relationship built yet between Kalo and a parent, we see some of those unhealthy patterns of relationships. We see the enmeshed parent who is really just devastated anytime their, their kiddo struggles or if a kid is mad at, um, you know, at, at a staff or uh, somebody else for holding a boundary, then that, that parent is really, you know, really expressing a lot of concern and a lot of frustration with that staff or, um, you know, they, they, they tend to want to rescue their kiddo. Uh, and that can be really tough, right? Because that's our natural inclination as a, as a parent is to protect and to nurture and to, and to rescue. Um, but that, that enmeshed rescue is, is really a misattunement. And, Remember that misattunement increases shame. How can me trying to help my kid increase their shame? Well, if you're really invested in rescuing your kid from a difficult situation, rather than helping them and supporting them and coaching them through, you're, you're unintentionally, I think, at times telling them, hey, you, you are not strong enough for this. So I, mama's got to... Mama bear's got to swoop in here and fix it for you, right? And that can be that can be a really difficult situation to navigate. So we see a lot of that within with enmeshment or with the micromanagement. You know, a lot of our families are really successful, influential, and have have succeeded at high levels because of their ability to to come in and take charge. Um, and so when they say they see their student maybe struggling with something or things aren't going exactly as, as they might want them to or plan them to, we see that kind of take charge um, mentality come into play. And that's a good thing. It's been helpful and, and successful in a lot of settings, and yet what it really indicates is a lack of trust um, because there isn't the relational capital there for a parent to really take a step back, focus on themselves, and allow this program and this experience to do what it's designed to do. Um, we may see appeasement or, or bargaining from, from a kiddo where it's really kind of the parent, the, the, we, what do we call it? The tail is wagging the dog is the expression that I hear a lot, right? Where the kiddo's demand or the kiddo's dysregulation is dictating what happens with their interaction with the parent versus the parent setting the boundaries and the limits and the bottom lines and the student having to adjust to that. And so we see, we see a lot of that and then we'll see, you know, there's just the burnt out detached parent who just can't do it anymore. It's just so much for so long that they can't come to a family session. They can make it to a, you know, a social call. They can't, they can't muster the strength or the energy to, to engage in the treatment process. I think another thing I want to make sure that everybody understands is that when we see these kind of patterns from our parents, we also recognize that that's the best that they can do in that moment, given the energy and the effort and the focus that they have to give. And so this isn't a judgment thing of, oh my God, that parent is really about understanding the impact that your kids struggles have had on you. So as we move forward in the process, we start to see an increase uh, of engagement in, in the program and in, in the therapy and the process. 
kids are starting to be more vulnerable. Um, they have less behavioral dysregulation, um, less emotional outburst. They're starting to build on some small successes. They start to feel a little bit of traction. Um, there's still a lot of preoccupation with everybody else. The focus is still outward. And that's really that shame starting to push back. Right? For a kid who likes to triangulate, there's, there's a, a benefit there. Right? Because if I can get my, my peers to argue with each other, then that takes the focus off of me. If I can get my parents to argue with each other, that takes the focus off of me. If I can get my parents and Kalo to, to be in conflict, that takes that focus off of me, right? And so, it's a herd of elephants out there. That, that, that is really that shame, trying to push the focus and the spotlight outward so that that inadequacy, that awfulness can hide in the shadows. And so, there's a, there's a, there's a, a benefit to that for our kids and that's why they're doing these things right it's survival how is this behavior helping them to survive everything is about survival for our parents you're starting to feel a little bit more okay i'm starting to get it i'm starting to get this casa thing i'm starting to get this empathy thing i'm starting to get this acceptance idea right and you start to develop okay i maybe i'm I'm, I'm not I'm not great at setting boundaries I'm not great at saying no I'm not I'm not great at um, you know I'm not I'm not great at sitting in the mud with my kid and letting them struggle but I'm getting better right I'm getting better at it it's still weird um, and so for for our parents this this becomes a pretty uncomfortable time right maybe you're starting to to feel some misalignment. Maybe your kid's been really good at triangulating and and it's you're starting to notice the the conflict that was there at home that that is still present. You gotta start to, to look at some of those issues and resolve them. Um, this is when things kind of get real. Right? Things get real for the family, for the parents, for the kiddo. And you settle in um, to really doing some deeper work. This is when we would really, you know, our goal is really to get some reps in, get some good solid reps in of acceptance for your kiddo um, and, and where they're experiencing that my parents, they don't just want to talk about the bad things that I'm doing. They want to get under the surface. They want to get into the emotion and they want to accept what's going on there. Right? And acceptance can be tough because it can feel like if I'm, if I'm accepting them, I'm accepting their behavior. And actually, their behavior is completely unacceptable, right? It's not acceptable for my kid to be unsafe. It's not acceptable for them to act out sexually. It's not acceptable for them to self-harm. And yet, if we look at it from this lens that that self-harm or that sexual acting out or that dysregulation, whatever it looks like, is their best attempt to feel safe and okay in that moment, and it's okay for them to want to feel safe and okay in that moment. Maybe that changes things a little bit, right? Because do we want our kids to feel safe? Yes. Do we want them to be able to feel safe in a way that's actually safe for them and for other people? Yes. But we have to start with acknowledging and accepting and co-regulating where they're at in that moment, in that emotion. So how do we show that? And we provide them a safe touch. We provide them with proximity. We provide them with empathy and, and actually sitting in the mud with them, right? Giving them space to feel however they're feeling. Advice doesn't work. Doesn't work. A good, thorough lecture on the pros and cons of their activity, it's not going to work. Right. Um, and so for our parents, this is really uncomfortable. You know, I, I can think of teenage daughters that for their dads, sitting in this emotion is really uncomfortable. For moms, really uncomfortable. And just any parent with any kid sitting in the middle of pain 
when your child is suffering, it's really uncomfortable. It's brutal. And yet this is what's necessary for your kid to feel like they're allowed to feel. Because once they're allowed to feel and their feelings are valid, that's a positive thing, right? And then they can build on that to be, well, maybe I'm allowed to feel this way, but maybe I don't have to feel this way. Maybe I can actually use some of those coping skills that everybody's been talking about and I can feel bad and survive that and then bring myself out of it. So this experiential model of really ex accepting whatever their experience is, whatever their emotion is, and it may be different than what's the reality. Right? That gets that can be hard. But whatever your kid's perception is, that's their reality. Even if it's not the facts. And so you know, we want to really sit in it with them. We want to go towards them, be with them. Uh, one of the great stories that comes to mind of a dad really practicing this and, and, and providing this experience of acceptance uh, comes from one of the one of the families I worked with a couple years ago, where you know a kid his M.O. when he struggled was to run. Uh, that's what he did, and. So one night things got hard and he ran. It was the middle of the winter and it was raining. And dad and mom are out driving around trying to find him. And eventually dad pulls him to this park and the kid was sitting there on the curb and the edge of this park in the rain. And your dad comes out and he says, you know, as he's telling the story, he says, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't want him to run. I just wanted to be close to him and so dad got out and he put his coat on and he went and he just sat on the curb next to his son in the rain he didn't lecture him didn't try to make him feel better didn't yell at him tell him to get in the car didn't tell him he's going to get sick he just sat next to him as close as he could without his son scooting away and he just sat there and it was that permission to feel and that proximity and that willingness to just sit there that validated his son enough to where the son said, all right, let's go home. And he gets up and he gets in the car and he goes home. And that, that story, could that scenario could have gone a hundred different ways. And yet, in that moment, Dad was willing to sit in the mud. And it created this experience for the kid that helped him to co-regulate. Beautiful story, beautiful moment. Um... I tell that story all the time. So as we've experienced more of this, this co-regulation, your kiddo's really getting some traction. They're engaged in programming. They're, they're starting to be more vulnerable and really do some deeper work with their therapists. Um, you know, they, they're, they're really deep in their work. Uh, we can actually see some regression from the kids, right? Because they're, they're dealing with some hard stuff. Um, they're dealing with the abandonment. They're dealing with the neglect. They're dealing with the rejection or whatever the overwhelming circumstance was that they experienced. They're starting to deal with that. They're starting to wrestle with that. Along with that, their friends are leaving. Right? If you've been at Kalo 9 to 12 months, you've seen a lot of students transition and go home or go to other programs, but they're not here. And so you've got new people and new relationships and new dynamics to figure out. It's overwhelming. And that anxiety of like... They said it was 12 month programs. I gotta go. I gotta get out of here, right? And, and I'm I'm caught between kind of a rock and a hard place because I I need to do this deeper work, but it's overwhelming, and I just want to go home, and I'm sad. And, and we can see a little bit of decompensation there from our kids, and that can be scary as a parent, um, because it feels like man, I'm writing this check, I'm writing another check this this month, and the kid's doing the same stuff he was doing before we got here, and. You know, there can be some, there can, there can definitely be some, some anxiety um, and some disengagement for our kids as they, they feel like they're, the end is near, but they know it's not. Um, for our parents, we're starting to see more confidence, more traction. Um, they're holding better boundaries. They're working on discharge planning. They're, they're taking the lead in family therapy. They're, you know, 
visits and off-campus visits and maybe home visits um, are more productive and, and, and we're seeing a building confidence. Not 100%, but we're getting there, right? Um, the effort here for families, for parents, for caregivers is really to build your CASA, right? Building those secure boundaries and limits with that foundation and focus being on safety, but not just having the ability to say no. It's, it's saying no and holding on to that no. And then when your kid reacts to it and says, oh, this is terrible, this is awful, it's not fair, and you're terrible, and you're awful, being able to go to a place of empathy and fill that boundary up with warmth and feel it, you know, fill it up with understanding and that experience of acceptance, right? So dad says no, and Billy says, this is stupid. And dad says, yeah, I can, I can get it, man. I understand. I don't like it when people tell me no. It's still no, but I get how you're feeling. That feels really, really good and really safe for a kid to hear that consistency of a no, but also the acceptance of how they're feeling and whatever their response is, right? So now we're in kind of this final stage of treatment. We're really starting to see a lot of good results um, from our kiddos. They're able to initiate and repair. They're managing their conflict, their emotion. They're, they're talking about things. They're respecting boundaries. They're holding boundaries. They're, maybe there's more, more assertiveness. Right? We can really see this difference from the kid that came to Kalo to the kid who's, who's here in Kalo. Um, now towards the end of his journey or end of her journey. And so uh, we, we start to see more of that engagement. And this is where for, as a parent, you start to feel like it's, it's getting close to time. And so as a parent, um, you're starting to look at what's next. Um, for me, this is, this is the most rewarding space. Um, I think of a story from a couple of days ago. We had a young man who has spent a ton of time in our safety team homes and has been in a ton of different physical interventions and has run from campus and has done all, you know, just a lot of, a lot of struggles, a lot of struggles. And, uh, so this kiddo was in art class and he was, uh, doing something that was outside the boundaries. And so he got coached on it and, probably coached on it in a way that wasn't exactly what, you know, we would draw up if we, if we were training our staff, it's not exactly how we want our staff to do it. And of course the kid was embarrassed and he was hurt and he's, you know, feeling that shame bubble up. And so what's, what's he do in response to that shame? He wants to protect himself. And so he gets really mad and, and, uh, and based on our history with him, you know, we know that when he gets to this place, it's, it's a good chance he's going to escalate into a physical intervention. And so luckily we had one of our fantastic team leads has a relationship with this kiddo and, and he was able to go in and engage with him. And this kid's experiencing this safe casa, right? He's experiencing somebody who he knows has good boundaries and limits along with an empathetic listening ear. And so this kiddo, he knows that this, this team lead, if it goes to an assist, a physical intervention, he'll go there with them. And he also knows that if he just wants to talk about it, he'll talk about it and he'll listen. And so they start talking, the, the, the guy's able to deescalate calm down the next morning he goes back to the, the art teacher on his own and initiates a repair says, yeah you know scott i'm sorry i'm i messed up i'm you know are we good right this is his best best attempt at a repair so this is what we're really looking for is not that your kids never going to get upset not that they're never going to struggle or have an emotional response but that they have an alternate option other than the loop of, of dysregulation that they're used to, right? They have a choice and they still have to make the choice, but they have a choice. 
And you as a parent begin to have the tools to help guide them to that choice. All right, so we're looking for that increased ability to manage conflict and say no, set the boundary, hold the boundary, but also provide that empathy and that listening, that understanding that allows your kid to process through, have that experience of being understood and felt and heard, and then hopefully choose a safe option, right? You're as a parent starting to do a lot of discharge planning, trying to flesh out what's it look like to do therapy at home? What's it look like to, um, you know, to have uh, school, you know, maybe it's a different school setting. Uh, maybe it's a different psychiatrist. Maybe you're, you're going to eliminate some social situations and, and add some new ones. You're really fleshing out what does life after Kayla look like? Um, this is when you start discussing, you know, aftercare planning with, with your therapist. We offer a four and eight week follow-up care, um, to facilitate that handoff of relationship from your Kayla therapist to your at-home provider. Um, but really we're seeing you as a parent take the lead you're, you're taking on the mantle of, of therapists, um, in some ways where you're able to be that really safe, secure CASA that you've practiced and practiced and practiced at being. So what's your part uh, as a parent, this can be really tough because your kids here, they're every day, they're doing work. Um, they're, they're inundated in it. Um, and, and it can be hard because you feel maybe disconnected. You're hundreds of miles away, or thousands of miles away. And, you know, you're just writing that check every month. And what's your part? Um, I think if I have one recommendation for a parent, what's your part? It's really do your own work. Um, during your, your kid's time here, we are really taking on that, that burden of supervision and, and working through things. Um, so that you can find your own healing in your own space uh, to deal with your own trauma, right? Your own secondary trauma, your own primary trauma. Secondary trauma we define as just the trauma, the new trauma that's created when your kid's trauma combines with your trauma and it creates new exponential trauma. Um, and so being able to do that work, please, 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 Please do that, that work. Uh, please have your own therapist at home and allow your Kalo therapist to, to consult and to share, hey, this is what my son or daughter is, you know, working on and and this is how, you know, this is how the Kalo therapist is experiencing the parent and share that and collaborate uh, in, in, in that information. Use your, your family liaison. We instituted that uh, mid-year last year and uh, the whole goal there is that you know you have a point person that you can go to to get information. Now, they're not always going to have all the information right then, um, but they're going to connect you to the right people or they're going to go find it for you. Um, and so utilizing your, your liaison as your agent, your kind of inside person um, where they, they're more familiar with, you know, all the ins and outs of Kalo and who to talk to and who to who to to consult with and what are the procedures and all these things, right? They're your agent. Um, completing surveys, we're gonna send out surveys every month. Um, and the goal with our surveys is to really identify what's going well and what's not. What are the trends that we're seeing? Is, is there a trend in a certain program or with a certain department, with a certain staff member, things that we need to, to address? And so, this is another way for you to use your voice and advocate for your kid and, um, and also to share praise. You know, if, if we're getting comments about a staff that things are going really, really well, um, we're going to pass along that praise to them. And that's, that's really nice to receive. If there's some constructive feedback and, you know, we need to do some coaching or some training for a staff, we're not necessarily going to share your comment with them, but we are going to provide that feedback. Uh, for them in a way that they can receive and they can grow from. And so uh, those surveys, as annoying as surveys are, really helpful to us and we use that data quite a bit. Um, we have quarterly seminars, retreats, or family days, depending on which program you're in. But every quarter there's a parent event. Um, the seminars are really about parent ed education and, and connection, whereas our retreats and family days are uh, focused on 
spending time and having experiences of therapeutic value with your kiddo. Um, if at some point you feel like, man, I'm, I've been here for a long time and uh, I'm not experiencing this, you know, the, the things that I, maybe I should feel like I should be ex experiencing. Maybe I feel like I'm actually been here for 10 months and I'm, I'm seeing more of the, the four or five, six month stuff. Right? And you're, you're concerned. Consult with your therapist, talk to your therapist, your clinical director, um, cause it could be a matter of perspective. Um, or it could be a matter of maybe we need to strategize a little bit differently to meet your particular student's needs. Um, and remember the goal is attunement. Our goal is not behavior. The goal is being able to tune into what your kiddo is, is telling you they need and, and provide that for them. The goal is not for your kid to, you know, you drop them off. It's not, we're not a mechanic shop. You don't drop your kid off and then come back some weeks later and they're fixed up, right? This is a, this is a, a process that you have to engage in. You have to learn, you have to develop these skills, these tools. Um, it's more like a, like a Home Depot where we say you can do it and we can help um, because ultimately as the caregiver, as the family, as the parent, you are taking on the responsibility back home for wherever this, your kiddo ends up, you're taking that on and you're facilitating that. You're the attachment figure. And so our goal is to, is to develop the, the skills and the knowledge to continue to provide those experiences of, of attunement and co-regulation throughout your kid's life. Lastly, we would just ask you to trust the process. This is a, this is a journey. This is a process. There are peaks and valleys, twists and turns, uh, throughout this whole, whole experience. Um, you know, we are not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We work really hard not to, uh, but at the end of the day, we're human. We're people trying to help people and, uh, and that can get messy. So as we work through the process, you know, know that your kiddo, they're doing their best. We recognize you as parents are doing your best. We're doing our best. And, and hopefully at the end of the day, at the end of the journey, we can look back and say, we all did our best and, and we got some really good results. Um, we've seen growth. We've seen change. We've seen healing. We've seen trust restored to our family. Uh, it's, it's work and it's hard work, um, but we're here to support you through that work and Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for uh, the trust. Uh, and and we, uh, we really value you as parents. We value your kids and the relationships that we're able to build. So hopefully this has been helpful. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And have a wonderful day. Thanks.